lot of hours of standing, cutting, hard on your feet. <laughs> A lot of work and it's tiring but it's worth it in the winter time and this is what I love to do people, our land, and the resources that, that flow from our land is, you know, critically important. The Balakula River is our lifeline. I don't know where we'd be without the river. Our people would be starving. It provides all the salmon we need. It's, every family lives on that, you know, whether it's fresh salmon or smoked salmon, prepared in every way, it's, it's in their it's in their homes and almost in every home. Health is uh, very important to us. You know, I think if it wasn't for this report, I wouldn't have taken uh, uh, care of myself in the last few years as I, as I have. You know. To me, it's like survival. It's your health. If, you, if you're not healthy, there's nothing else that matters. I think I don't think our people want to be rich. They just want to be happy and comfortable. Because this is such a beautiful place. Yeah. That's part of our healing is the what's all around us. For thousands of years, the Newhawk people have lived off the bounty of the lands and waters along the Bella Coola River on Canada's rugged and dramatic west coast. The study of the New Hulk food system was Sine's inaugural effort to document an indigenous diet, to assess the nutritional values of the population's traditional food, and to promote a healthy traditional based diet. Though challenges remain, these efforts initiated more than 25 years ago are still in place today with remarkable and rewarding results. Walking in the woods even, we knew what foods we can eat just, just by picking them, like the, uh, what we know in those symbol berries, the new shoots that come out of the ground, we, we'd eat that all the time. So we used to play down the, by the creek and pick berries and shoots and everything and have our little lunches in, our, um, in the symbol berry leaf. We'd make a bowl and eat, that was our lunch. Because in my, in my parents' day, it seemed like every home in the old town, the old village, had their own fruit trees, their own vegetable gardens, their own um, pigs, chickens, horses, cows, so they're very self-sufficient. Right away, and the first salmon that was caught, there was always a ceremony. There was the, the person that caught that first spring salmon basically would not eat it. He'd invite guests, and then based on their rank, would give them the best part of the salmon and then have a little feast done by the river here. They would not keep the first salmon at the crop, they'd share it with the rest of the community members. The prominent thing I remember is that when we were doing fish, we did it as a family, you know, we preparing our fish, like sockeye, for example, or smoking springs, we all did it as a family unit. It was very prominent that it was an important part of our diet. My mom and dad used to go out visiting quite a bit. We had no TV, no radio, or anything like that. So visiting was a lot in this community. And every time we go to visit someone, it's just like they, like we had a mini potlatch where you bring out all kinds of food just to share with everybody. And then when the introduction of the deep freeze and fridge and stuff like that came around, our ideals and way of thinking changed. Now we just store it into the deep freeze or fridge and keep it more for itself without that sharing. Beginning some 50 to 60 years ago, growing Western influences began to affect the delicate balance between the New Hulk people, the food they ate, and the way they lived. 
a lot of obesity, a lot of um, the, in, the uh, influx of the, what we call junk food today. People shopping in the grocery stores instead of um, growing their own food. That, that was really chains back in the 70s, early 80s, I believe. So you can start to see the trends of the behavior um, around our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health, spiritual health, all of that started to deteriorate for our community. And even some of the elders said, well, we have to learn our new ways now. The old ways are gone now. We have to change and adapt. In my experience, some of those values and principles of our elders and our ancestors will never change. They'll be there forever. We have to learn to follow them. The availability of market foods led to the gradual demise of Indigenous food preparation and consumption, resulting in a decline in the health of the Newhalk people. I observed that a lot of our, our uh, people, Newhalk people and First Nations communities, started uh, swinging away from tourism foods, you know, and uh, you know, realizing they, uh, you know, as a young person, uh, that's all I knew was tourist and foods when I was uh, as, a, as a child. And uh, in my, uh, my young adult life, uh, I observed that there was a big, uh, the trend was to move away from our tourist and foods and moving towards uh, store-bought foods, you know. And, uh, and I noticed too that uh, it seemed to be that our people, uh, their health started to deteriorate, you know. So that I thought, well, this, this project will help us, you know, uh, to encourage us to utilize our natural foods, our traditional foods, you know, to, and it will uh, uh, bring forward uh, healthier uh, Newhawk people again. The Sine program sought to address these issues by drawing on Newhawk cultural history and using traditional food as a pathway to understanding and promoting good health. The program began by documenting indigenous foods and their nutritional value, such as the ooligan, a small fish that had long provided an essential source of many nutrients in the Newhawk diet. To establish a baseline for evaluation, the overall health of the Newhawk people was assessed, and then programs developed to involve the Newhawk in rediscovering and understanding the nutritional and cultural value of their traditional based diet. So we got involved in this project because it became clear that the health of Aboriginal peoples throughout Canada, and especially here in British Columbia, was at greater risk than the general Canadian or British Columbian population. We did a dietary study um, looking at the dietary intake of adults in the community and found that there were a series of micronutrients that were seriously short in the diet. And these were vitamin A, both the animal form as retinol, and the plant form is carotene, folic acid, and iron, all three of them being micronutrients especially important in maternal and child nutrition. So the other thing that uh, was of concern to the community was uh, what the elders were saying about the fact that the young people, especially the young mothers, are using less and less of their traditional food and they just had this impression that the health was very poor because people were not eating very well. And the idea both from the uh, elders and from the council was that the use of, of the local New Hulk food was so low and the, the idea that the cultural morale would be improved greatly if they could em enhance the use of their traditional food. So that was one of the major goals of the program, to build up the cultural attention to the local New Hawk food and to use the local New Hawk food as a vehicle for understanding health and nutrition. A variety of projects were designed to involve the New Hawk people in learning about the nutritional value of their indigenous foods. It was all documented in a nu nutrition handbook and uh, there was another thing that, that was really um, important to the community was they developed their own cookbook with uh, these traditional recipes 
that um, have been passed on from generation to generation. And it's something that the Newhawk people are very proud of. Yeah, one part of the um, working with the Newhawk Nutrition Project was um, setting up classes, like fish cutting classes, with um, the elders, like with both my grandmothers. Um, just getting people together and them teaching us how to cut the fish. It was the elders that really uh, helped us to to show us how to do it. And uh, I think quite a few of us learned different, little different ways, but uh, they were the ones that really got us going. We were able to have girls going up to the schools. There were girls that went out picking berries. There were girls that made the food, uh, fruit leather and took them to school. And the juice that was made, they took that to the school. Like when we were learning how to cut fish and stuff, we put it away for the community feasts and we went out and collected all the um, like cow parsnips and different um, plants and we found recipes that, from different native communities and other places and made up the um, meals for the people and when we first had a community feast like I I thought no one would come because they you know this is our traditional food and it was quite amazing how many people came and but I remember all the work they were doing um, harvesting berries, reintroducing roots and other things, and um, things like stinging nettle and um, devil's club and um, other things that are really um, natural medicine. And of course, the hooligans. Um, studying the benefits of the, the grease and how good it is for your body, your bones, your eyes, your skin, everything. Part of the thing was teaching hooligan grease making. We had people come over across the river and right from where they sained the hooligans, did everything, getting the boxes ready for um, making the hooligan grease. You had to have the hooligans ferment for 10 days <clears throat> before you can um, do anything with them. And usually there's a layer of cedar boughs and the hooligans and they put another layer of cedar, cedar boughs on top. Community-based activities were organized and Indigenous New Hog food gathering and preparation information was documented and made available to the people through two books, still popular more than 20 years later. It's the New Hulk Nutrition Handbook, and we put this together so that people can um, go back and look at all the different foods that are available in the valley. Talks about the, the fish, how to cut the fish, and when the fish are in the rivers. Um, so we actually put, put together a cookbook to go along with this, because there's when we're doing the interviews, it seemed like you know it'd be a good idea to have a cookbook to go along with this. So. And people do use the cookbook. It's, it's a very popular um, reference for everybody that does any um, food gathering or food preparation. So the sharing of the recipes was really good because you were able to try different styles of preparation. And, most people would find one they like the best and use it. We're storytelling people, we pass it on by stories, but now we have to adapt and change and we have to leave something written and written form for future generations. I think a lot of it just lost because most of it was handed down just from word of mouth and showing them how to do it. So I notice a lot of young people don't do it as much as we did when we were young. Yeah. So it was a gradual loss, like most everything else in our culture. So the next best thing is to record it. Yeah. Make sure it's documented properly. At least it'll be there for future generations now. While health challenges continue for many of the Newhawk people, Cine programs have resulted in improving health statistics and a renewal of cultural awareness and pride. So the difference between the before period and the after period were pretty remarkable. Uh, with all of the activities of the program, 
uh, we were able to show that there was increased food use, not only in actual amounts of food use, but the numbers of families that uh, actually used each of the traditional food in, in the different categories, the fish, the berries, the greens, and the game foods as well. So there was increased food use, and as well, in the health assessments, we were able to show improved blood values for vitamin A, for both retinol and carotene, for folic acid, and for teens for um, iron. So we feel that the results uh, were outstanding and that the community conducted an extremely successful program. Having that project come here, it, it really made myself and others more aware of just what it is we have or had and we could have lost if it wasn't at least recorded or documented. The legacy of the nutrition project is, is such that uh, it did bring to our attention that we can still yet today rely on what's out in the forest to, to feed us, to nutrient us, to keep our bodies healthy. It's just up to us now as individuals to take the next step and to actually do it instead of talking about it. I think we learned so much from that program. And, you know, a lot of people have been more aware of their bodies uh, from that time. And I think they're, they can know when there's something wrong and uh, are able to almost tell what's wrong and when they go to the doctor before they didn't care when, until things were too, too bad. I find there's a lot of the younger generation um, are learning, like they are um, learning how to cut fish and berry picking. Like it's slowly coming back. Where Once people learn about the value of what that food really is, and it, it becomes more important to follow those principles of growing your own food, being self-sufficient. A lot of our people are, uh, are unemployed, you know, but uh, I think though that uh, the importance of our, of our traditional foods is uh, that study. It's provided a resource to, to our people, you know, that uh, although the uh, uh, job situation is, uh, is not very healthy, you know, you could still lead healthy lives. You know. I stay as closely to my traditional diet as I possibly can. Yeah, I swear by it. I love it. I can do anything with it. <laughs> From making sushi to curries. <laughs> you just... And I think today, you know, um, a lot of us have become really creative with our traditional foods. Despite Newhawk's success at understanding and addressing their nutritional issues, their efforts are limited by factors such as unemployment and environmental issues that impact their natural environment and the availability of indigenous foods. You know, spaghetti and all kinds of noodles and stuff like that are not, not very healthy for us, but because of a lot of people are forced to that no jobs, living on welfare, and so they have to buy what they can. I am fortunate myself that I'm working, but there's, you know, a large percentage of uh, community members that are unemployed, and um, it's really embarrassing, you know, what they, they, you know, they don't, what they have to live on. And I'm sure a lot of them don't choose to, you know, be in the situation that uh, they are in, but the uh, employment is, it's very scarce here, and you know the oligan is gone now, and the sockeye is depleting. We don't have the steelhead. We don't have the steelhead like we used to have years ago. So yeah, there's a lot of environmental uh, concerns in our community. You know, people are living on welfare. 
you know, they don't have any money, they don't have anything, and they've been happy with their fish, you know? but if you take that away, there's going to be a huge problem, because that's what they rely on. I don't know where we'd be without the river. Our people would be starving because of this, our economic conditions where 80% of our people are unemployed. And you can't live on $185 a month. There used to be deep ice walls and caverns of ice and big snow packs and stuff. Now it's warming up so it's changed a lot. The river's changed. The logging in different valleys has pushed a lot of the different nice deep dark pools that used to be there filled in so salmon are suffering so are we you can see it and we're still persevering though hooligans are, are no longer running in this river eight years ago was the last time we had some a good crop of hooligans i really see uh, a lot of our people getting more sick more often especially the children because we don't have hooligan grease in our diet anymore it's something that, as I get older, it seems like my, my body craves for it, and I, it was real noticeable since the absence of the hooligan grease from eight years ago. And in myself, I started noticing, I, I started getting a little bit sick, that it, it wouldn't really get me enough to make me want to lay down in bed and just get enough but rest, but it seems to lag on and on and on. And I hear other comments, of, I mean, other community members saying the same thing, and. And I, I find the be able because of lack of gluten, please. You know, our job is to make sure that our land is healthy, you know, and uh, we try to do that to the best of our abilities. And with this study, you know, uh, I know we, uh, we were able to uh, convince the, uh, the Ministry of Forest to stop uh, spraying chemical on on the lands that were being reforested by these uh, forest companies. And we made a strong, strong uh, effort to, to uh, stop uh, the, this chemical spraying in, in these uh, er areas that were being reforested by forest companies and uh, explaining that, that uh, the health of our, of our lands and the, the, the health of the plant life in, in these areas are of uh, major importance to us. Despite the challenges the Newhawk people face, the Sine study continues to pay important dividends in efforts to preserve their cultural heritage and to protect the future health of the Newhawk nation. Well, our people always talked about where we come from and who we are. And they always said that everything we have comes from our Creator. And they talk about richness. I remember my aunt saying to me once that, Somebody said we were poor people, and she says, I would never, never ever consider myself poor. I said, we had three or more square meals a day, we had a home shelter over our heads, we had clothes on our back, and we had a family. We had a community that was rich with food and rich with resources. That was our richness. It's, it's spiritual, it's... It's everything around us. That's the richness that we have. It's our culture, our beliefs, our values that hopefully will never change. <laughs>